Just in case anyone is worried about my bearings, after a quick clean out, this is what they sound like. Nothing to worry about. What's up everyone? Welcome to another Joel Arsenal YouTube video. In this one, I'm going to be rebuilding this Crash KV997 crankshaft. As most of you probably already know, I recently acquired several crankshafts that need rebuilding, so I purchased myself a hydraulic press, and in this video, I am going to rebuild my very first crankshaft. I've worked at shops before, and I've taken part in some of the processes, but this is the first crankshaft that I've rebuilt from start to finish by myself, and I'm going to take you guys through the process. If you guys want to support me on Patreon, there is a link in the description below. Every little bit helps. If you guys want to see extras, outtakes, and random nonsense, I have a second channel called Lowered Expectations, a link also in the description below. I did have to build a few special tools to make this project happen, but I won't be going over that in this video because it's already going to be long enough, so I'm going to release that in a separate video. If you want to see that, be sure to stay tuned. That being said, I am going to start off this video by explaining to you guys the special puller that I made for removing bearings. The way that this works is bearings have balls in them and those balls sit in grooves. And so what I did is I basically measured the size of the balls and I made the biggest part of this the same size as the ball or a little bit bigger. And then I machined down a little bit of a shoulder and then machined off the sides here and here. I'm not sure how well the camera picks that up. Basically the way it works is you slide it into the bearing. First you have to remove the cage and that allows me to put this piece in and then I can turn it 90 degrees. And once I have it turned 90 degrees sitting in the groove, it locks in there and it won't come out. Let's make sure these are rotated 90 degrees. Tighten these zip ties up. All right, I'm going to put a little bit of force on it, not going to push it too hard. Got pretty good tension on it there now. Whoa, it moved. That scared the crap out of me. <laughs> Heat is your friend, folks. That was easier than I thought it was going to be. For the next one, I'm actually going to point the camera at the gauge, but for this one, I'm just going to point it here so that you guys can see what's happening. All right, we are up to, oh, that was only about four tons, maybe four tons. Pretty much every time you push something apart, you're gonna have some stuff fall. <laughs> That's just the way it is. But uh, I've got the one web pushed off. Here's our thrust washer. Here's a connecting rod. I don't know what this thing weighs, but it's pretty substantial. So what I need to do is make sure that I've got this picked up, secured in my right hand. And then I take the crank in my left hand. Try to slide the two together. Line everything up, and then... <laughs> oh, 
And once I'm done this, I need to go in the house and do my exercises for my knee and get my knee back in working order because it's still not great. And then I need to edit a video for Patreon. You heard that right. I do indeed have a Patreon account, a link in the description below. If you want to stay up to date on what I'm doing and get a little bit of behind the scenes, feel free to check that out. There's four tons. Oh, this one's taking quite a bit more. There's five tons. Oh, so I went to about six tons. See, there's quite a bit of rust on that pin. The oil retention was quite good, but uh, definitely some pitting on there. This one wasn't nearly as bad for some reason. What you guys are about to see is me using this tool to make some marks on the crank center pin and webs. Do not pay attention to this as it was a fail. Later in the video, I will show you guys the process that I used to phase the crank that actually worked. I've been contemplating how to push these webs off and I think what I'm going to do is use this plate and actually push the bearing and the web off all at once. I don't like that idea because there's going to be a lot of force. This might take 10 tons or 15 tons to actually push it apart because it's actually pushing two things at the same time. But uh, the alternative to that is pushing way out on the outside of the web and I don't like the idea of that either. So I think this is the lesser of the evils. And so that's what I'm gonna do. Put that like that. I ended up turning down this chunk of metal so that this part will actually fit through the web. And that way I can put that directly on here. Let's see, how many tons is this gonna take? There's six tons. Oh, good. <laughs> this bearing is in horrible shape. Oh man. When you're using a press, a lot of your special tools look an awful lot just like blocks and sticks of metal because they're Same thing as the other one, I went to about six and a half tons.
I now have the crankshaft pushed apart into its individual components and laid out on the table. I'm going to be reusing these crank seals because they're in good shape and because I couldn't actually find any. So it's good that they're in good shape. So the only parts out of all of this that I'm going to be reusing other than the seals will be the crank webs themselves and this center pin. Uh, the bearings, all of the bearings, thrust washers, connecting rods, outer seals, all that stuff is getting replaced. The first step of reassembly is going to be putting these seals back onto the center pin before I push the bearings on. And before I do that, I'm going to put some assembly lube on these. It doesn't look like they actually used any lube from the factory, which is really strange to me, but uh, I'm definitely going to be loading them up. So. Let's do that. Make sure I get lots of assembly lube in here. Can't really use too much. This seal is a bit of a stretch. I know it's probably hard to pick up on camera, but there's a little bit of a step or a lip here and the seal actually rides on this intersection or the smaller diameter. You have to get it over the big piece to get it down onto the small piece. These are the bearings that I'm using for the inner section of the crank, the two inner bearings. They happen to be the same bearing as a 580 650 uh, 89 to 96. The number on the bearing itself is 6207NC3. The C3 is fairly important because what that is, is they actually give a little bit more play in the bearing, which allows it to heat up more without uh, causing the bearing to tighten up. So that's fairly important if you're getting bearings. If it says C3 on the originals, fairly important to have that on the one you're replacing it with. That job was so incredibly easy with a press. I'm going to try to push the bearing onto the pin just a little bit more just so that I have a bit of the shaft sticking out. I'm using a socket. I'm not sure if the diameter of the socket's big enough, but it looks like it is. All right, that will do. It won't go on very far, but it managed, it managed to push it on a little bit. So now I'm going to do that same thing on the other side. This will make it easier to get the crank web started. There we go. You can see now the shaft is sticking out just slightly from the bearing. I'm very much figuring this out as I go and so now I have the part flipped over. The reason for that is that the pin actually needs to be pushed in flush to this surface. And so if I had it flipped over this way and continued pushing it through, what would happen because there's this step, the pin would actually go too far because it would protrude until it hit the plate. And so what I'm going to do, I've got it flipped over this way and I'm going to use something to push down directly on the web and that way it will only push down until that piece hits the pin. I will show you guys now what I mean. I now have six and a half tons on it and it looks like it's pressed on fairly flush. So let's take a look. And I somehow miraculously ended up with my alignment marks very close to being lined up. So that will give me some sort of an idea 
if I uh, still have the crank phased properly when I get it together. As soon as I got finished pushing this web on, I realized that it's going to make it a little bit difficult to get the big end pin in. Not impossible, but it is going to make it a little bit more difficult. So what I'm actually going to do now before I push this web on is put the pin in and that's going to make it a whole lot easier. This is the connecting rod that I'm using. It is a Pro X connecting rod kit. Same as a CR500. All right, I need to do some measurements. CR500 pin, 67.57.2603. These are a lot shorter. What is going on there? The connecting rod is the same, the pin is different. Okay, so I need to find out if I can machine this pin. Good news, it works, kinda. As I think I already showed you guys, the CR500 pin was a little bit too long, actually almost 10 millimeters too long. Fortunately, I was able to put it in my lathe and cut it down. It was a bit of a slow and annoying process, but I've got one of the pins cut down. I'm gonna have to do the other one, but first we're gonna press this one in. Have I mentioned yet how when you're filming, everything is a little bit harder. Not only is it working, but I can actually see how far the pin's going in. I wanted to mention again quickly that I should not be using alignment marks to try to phase this crank, but a chain of events have been set in place that I cannot undo, so I'm gonna press the crank together now. I will show you guys later how I actually did it properly. I don't know if I was recording that last bit, but I've started to push the crank back together. I've got the aluminum shims under here to keep this supported evenly. I've got the marks lined up that I made earlier and now I'm using a socket to push on here and it goes on until the pin surface is flush with the web surface. It's taking about four tons of force to push it on. Okay, I have to be careful now because I'm pushing down on this pin. It could push through the bottom of the web, so I'm actually going to release now. Ah, oh, look what happened. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to need to support underneath this pin. Now that I've supported underneath the pin, I can push this web into place and then I'm gonna have to basically push the crank back apart a little bit. Which isn't too big of a deal, but it's a bit annoying. All right, there's eight tons, that should be flush. Now what I gotta do is put this back in here this Whoa. and push that pin back through because I pushed it too far. This 
This should do it. There we have it, that is perfectly flush. Now that I have the two inner crank webs pressed on and phased, I'm going to install one of the connecting rods. And my thinking is that no matter how careful I am, I'm probably gonna end up with some dirt and debris in this during the assembly process, no matter how careful I try to be. What I'm going to do is put the bearings on and then once it's all assembled, I'm going to clean the crank off, uh, blow it out with compressed air and uh, make sure that everything is nice and clean before I put any assembly lube in the bearings. Because if I put assembly lube in there now, it's, uh, it's going to be really hard to clean any crud out of there after. This is easier with grease, of course, because the bearings all just stay in place, but you can do it without it, as you see. You just gotta be a little bit clever. And lucky. Assembling this crankshaft with a piece of angle iron isn't going to get it perfect. I will need to do some adjustments, but I believe that this is the best way to do it considering the way that the crank webs are built. On some crankshafts, if they have a full web, so if they don't have the web with a big notch cut out of it, then you can actually use a straight edge to line everything up. But for this one, basically you sit the webs in the, in the uh, angle iron and then you kind of put it together and then you get a hammer or something and you tap this on to get it started and then you press it together. The reason why this works is because if it was out of alignment, you can see if it was twisted like that, obviously the pinhole doesn't line up. And so when the hole actually lines up is when everything is the way that it's supposed to be. So again, it's not gonna be perfect, but it'll be fairly close. So I'm gonna take a hammer and just gently tap on here. I now have that on there just enough so that I can carry it over to the press and then I can finish pressing it on. I've pushed the crank together just a little bit too far and now what I'm doing is using the feeler gauge. I'm going to start putting pressure on this and when it gets to the right clearance I will be able to uh, slide these two feeler gauges in and uh, yeah all will be well. So let's start pumping. After pressing that crank web on and setting the clearance for the connecting rod, I actually trued that part of the crank up off camera. I promise that I will show the other side to you guys, but I just wanted to get the hang of it a little bit. And also I had to deal with camera memory issues. So now I've set up my lathe so that I can check the phasing. I did put some marks on the crank, but I have a feeling that it's actually going to be out a little bit. I got this idea from Alan Milliard. It's not an idea of my own and I've just spent a whole bunch of time setting up my lathes so that I can do this. I know that at least a few of you are interested in this so I'm going to go over this in a little bit more detail than some of you might want to know. 
But uh, yeah, this is for those of you who uh, want a little bit more detail. So let's get to it. Some lathes have a degree wheel built into the pulley on the lathe. Mine does not, and it doesn't have an easy way to mount the degree wheel on here. So I actually turned the pulley into a very simple degree wheel that has markings every 90 degrees. I did that by mounting a degree wheel into the chuck itself and then I used the tool to point at the numbers. Then with this little arm in place, I rotated the wheel, put a mark on the pulley, rotated it again 90 degrees, put a mark on the pulley and so on. So now I have a pulley that is marked every 90 degrees with the indicator arm that tells me exactly where it's at. The next thing I have is a wrist pin that is bolted to a tool holder and I have a wrist pin bearing on there. This is stuff that fits the crash and then what I can do is put this on. This is going to be fiddly so I'm going to probably cut and come back when it's on. I wanted to jump in here and mention a few things that are fairly important but may not be terribly obvious. The first being that most small lathe tool holders are not going to be big enough to hold a wrist pin. So what I actually did, I have this homemade tool holder that I made a few years ago. Some of the dimensions were screwed up on it so I actually just drilled a hole through it, tapped it and that's how I bolted my wrist pin directly to the tool holder. If you have a big enough tool holder in your lathe, then you can just put the uh, wrist pin directly in it. But if not, you can buy a cheap tool holder or use one that you have and do the same thing that I've done. The second thing that is very important is that you need to make sure that you have the wrist pin perfectly aligned with the spindle of the lathe, which would be perfectly aligned with the uh, alignment of the crankshaft, parallel to the crankshaft. If you do not have it perfect, perfectly aligned, you will not be able to get the connecting rod on or off regardless of how well your crank is phased. Now that I have the rod seated up against the tool holder with the bearing on the pin, the crank cannot rotate and just to make sure that nothing can move, I'm actually going to lock the cross slide in place. And that means that even if I turn or try to turn this dial now, it won't be able to move. So this is now locked in place. I can move it this way and this way, but it can't move this way. Now what I need to do is make sure that I have one of these marks on the pulley lined up. And so I actually need to loosen off the chuck and rotate this until it lines up and then tighten the chuck back up just enough so that I can turn it. And get it exactly lined up. I'm gonna have to move you guys so that I can see this mark exactly. All right, that is exactly lined up. So now I can tighten the chuck back up. Now that I have that lined up perfectly and have a good reference point, what I need to do is move the apron across to the right, removing the bearing and the pin from this connecting rod. Now that I have the apron moved over and the wrist pin and bearing are completely out of the way, I can go back over to the pulley and rotate the whole crankshaft 180 degrees. That is 90 degrees, and that is exactly 180 degrees. And now comes the part where hopefully this starts to make sense to you guys. Because this is locked in place, the only way this connecting rod will fit on here is if this is actually phased properly. If this is out by even a degree, there's no way that this connecting rod will actually go onto this wrist pin. So I have a feeling it's actually not going to work. Now I have the connecting rod on the wrist pin with the bearing and there is a bearing in this end on this pin. So now 
We're going to go back over to the pulley and the pulley is going to show us how far off we are from actual 180. So we got good news and bad news here. The good news is that I'm able to accurately check my crank. The bad news is that it is actually off by one degree. If this were not a performance engine, that would probably be okay, but I'm going to push this apart and then actually show you guys how I'm going to use this to put the crank back together so that it's actually lined up properly. I now have it set up in my lathe again, set at zero degrees. So now what I'm going to do is rotate it 180 degrees as indicated by the marks on the pulley. And so this is 90 and this is exactly 180 degrees right there. Now I have the rod on the big end pin on the crank web. I'm going to slide the connecting rod onto the wrist pin bearing and then I can roll the apron over and this is basically a self-correcting system. The only place that this can go on is in a 180 degree phase. Before I tap on this with a hammer I will double check to make sure that my mark hasn't moved on the pulley so I'll show you guys that real quick. I've got that mark lined up perfectly at 180 degrees. And all I need to do now is take a hammer and gently tap on the crank web. That will seat it in place and then I can take it over to the press and finish pushing it together. Now that I have it seated on there, I'm going to double check the 180 mark to make sure nothing has moved. Then I can take it over to the press and finish pushing it together. Just in case it's not terribly obvious, this is how I should have phased the crank in the first place instead of trying to use reference marks. A big thanks to Alan Milliard for sharing this. Uh, I don't know how I would have done it if I hadn't seen his video. If you guys haven't seen any of his videos or if you haven't seen all of them, go check him out. He does some crazy, crazy engine builds and uh, yeah, next level stuff. Hooray, it wasn't a catastrophic failure. I've got the webs both pushed on flush and the marks are lined up. I'm going to put this back in the lathe and double check the phasing just to see if it turned while I was pressing it together, but I suspect that it's gonna be perfect. I put the crankshaft back into the lathe to check the phasing. I've already done that and fortunately it is perfectly at 180 degrees so I am really happy with that. The next part of this build is going to be to put the connecting rod onto that pin and then press the other web on and then I will show you guys the process of checking and truing a crankshaft. Alright folks, the closer I get this to perfect before pressing it together, the less amount of work I'll have to do to true it. So uh, take my time here and make sure that this is lined up as good as I can get it. The other one was about 40 thousandths I believe. The way that I'm going to be checking the trueness of the crankshaft at first is between centers on the lathe. So there's a pointy bit that goes in here and a pointy bit that goes in here. 
and there are holes in the ends of the crankshaft where those pointy bits go in and support the crank. And then I can rotate the crankshaft and see how much it's out on my dial gauge here. So I'm going to set this so that it's around zero and then I'll rotate it. Okay, so my zero needs to be changed substantially because that's not the lowest point. So we can see our lowest point is right about there, so we'll make that zero. So that is now my zero. This is just an approximate just to see how far off we are. So this is about 25 thousandths out. What I need to do now is figure out where it's out and what I need to do to actually make the corrections. So right now the lowest point on the crankshaft is right there and the highest part of the crankshaft is right here. So what this tells me, and I'm not going to try to explain this in detail, but what this tells me is that the crank is twisted. You can see the rod is pointed towards me instead of away from me and it is high right here. So what that means is I need to hit the crankshaft on this web right here and try to rotate the crank on the pin. And in order to do that, because I don't have a copper or brass hammer, I'm actually using this giant chunk of lead. And then recheck it. It takes a substantial amount of force to get these things to move, but with that one session of beating, I was able to get it to eight thousandths. So that's pretty good for one session. That being said, it's probably gonna take me an hour or more to get this to where I want it. I don't have the specs on this because I don't think Crash actually publishes the numbers for this crankshaft, but I'm gonna use the specs off of a ZXI 1100 crank and they want it to be 1.5 thousandths with a service limit of 4 thousandths. And I was able to get the other side all the way down to one thou. So if I can get this side to one thou, I will be really happy with that. After one more session of smashing with that big chunk of lead, I got it down to five thousandths, which is really good. I'm getting better at this already. But something interesting happened that I want to show you guys. I'm glad that this happened. So before it had a high spot here. So I actually have a little X marked on it where I wanted to hit it. The high spot was here and the low spot was here. So the low spot was with the connecting rod pointed towards me and the high spot was with the connecting rod or the big pin away from me. Now the high spot is with the webs pointing up the rod at the bottom and the low spot is actually with the rod at the top. What that means is that the crank is actually twisted like this on the pins. So it is actually further apart here than it is at the pin. So what I need to do now is actually take this and squish it in the vise and close up this gap. When I close up this gap, it will make this side drop and uh, get us closer to true. Knowing how much to squish it is kind of a trial and error thing. So hopefully I didn't go too far. If I did, I will just have to spread it the other way. As I was telling you guys before, the rod is now away from me and that's the highest point. And with the connecting rod close to me, that is the lowest point. So again, you have to figure out exactly how the crank is off and then make your adjustments and recheck it. This is a process that takes a lot of time and you are very likely to go too far with it and then have to make some corrections and go back the other way. The closer you get to perfect, the easier it is to make a mistake where you go too far. Now that I checked it between centers, I'm checking it in this truing stand that I made. 
The reason for doing this is that I don't trust that these holes are drilled perfectly center on either ends of the shaft. And I'm glad that I checked it this way because it's pretty obvious that it's out. You can even see it moving. And if you look at that needle swinging, it's, uh, that's over 70 thousandths of run out. So I've got a lot of work to do. I was going in the right direction, but I need to do a whole lot of banging on this web. I've collected lead for quite a few years and I have it melted down into this giant block. And this is what I've been using to hammer on the crankshaft. It's not very accurate. It's pretty cumbersome, and so what I've decided I'm going to do is actually try to build myself a hammer. This is going to be my handle, which is part of a lawnmower handle that I cut out. And I'm making a mold out of this piece of square tubing. Some say only the chosen one can lift this hammer. But in all seriousness, if you guys want to see how I actually made this hammer and some of the other tooling, I will be releasing a separate video on that, so be sure to stay tuned. I don't know how well the camera can pick this up, especially with the connecting rod passing through the field of view, but uh, I've got both sides of the crankshaft within a thousandth of an inch. That's at zero. That's less than a thousandth. Now I'll flip it around the other way and show you guys the other side. This side's even better. It's only about a half a thou. I'm now going to push on the PTO bearing, which just so happens to be this WSM Polaris bearing. It fits a 650 and a 785, 93 to 2000 according to the packaging. And it also fits a crash on the PTO side. The mag side bearing for this engine, once again I got from WSM, it is for a Yamaha 650, 760, 1100. And uh, yeah, there's the part number on it. I had quite a hard time finding this and it is, uh, this was I think $94 American just for this one bearing.
There we have it folks, a completely rebuilt KV997 crankshaft using Polaris, Sidu, Yamaha and Honda parts. We've got a Polaris bearing on this end, Sidu bearings in the center and a Yamaha bearing on the end. The connecting rods, pins and bearings are all from a CR500 which is a Honda and I have it trued up running within a thousandth of an inch. I am very happy with the way this turned out. These are some of the tools that I made slash used to get this thing sorted out. Uh, starting with the puller that I used to get the bearings off. These are tools that I made for the press to get the crank apart and back together. This is the balancing tool. And of course you guys saw me make the uh, mold for the hammer and the hammer itself. I decided I would weigh this for you guys and show you how much this weighs because I was saying earlier that a hammer would cost me about $100, between $75 and $100. That was for a two pound hammer. This is actually a two pounds, 15.5 ounces, so a three pound hammer. And uh, yeah, it basically cost me nothing except for a few minutes of time. So again, I'm really happy with the way this turned out for my first crankshaft rebuild. Now I need to put this back into the cases and get this engine rebuilt, but I've got a lot of work to do before then, and that is going to be for another video. I believe I mentioned to you guys somewhere in this video that I wasn't using assembly lube while putting the crank together, and I'm glad that I didn't because I did end up with some debris in these inner bearings. So I'm going to have to clean them out. If there was assembly lube in them, it would be a whole lot harder to clean them out. If you listen to this bearing, perfectly quiet. This bearing is also perfectly quiet. Those are the two last bearings that I pushed on and they haven't had chance to get any dirt in them. However, these two inner ones, that one's very bad. And that one, again, has some stuff in it. So all of the assembly process and then smacking it around with a hammer to true everything out. I got a little bit of stuff in there, so I'm gonna make sure that I clean all the bearings out very thoroughly and then only apply the assembly lube uh, right before I put the cases together. That's gonna do it for this one. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, it'd be great if you click that like button and also subscribe because I would like to see you here again. As you guys can see behind me, I have plenty of crankshafts that are in need of rebuilding. So I will be doing some shorter videos with a little less detail on some of those. I have some three cylinder cranks that need to be phased at 120, so that should be interesting. I'll be using the same process, but I'll have to put a few more marks on my lathe pulley. If you guys wanna support me on Patreon, there is a link in the description below. Every little bit helps. If you guys wanna see extras, outtakes, and random nonsense, well, that's my second channel called Lowered Expectations. Link also in the description below. Thanks for hanging out with me here. Thanks for your support. Thanks for everyone who supports me on Patreon. That's gonna do it for this one. I will see you guys next time. This will probably be my last update. I'll turn off the camera and uh, show you guys the finished product. But I just wanted to show you guys that there's an airplane flying over. And I most of the time have to do each shot about six times because there's Megan coming in the door.